Well, hey, Bridge Point. Yeah. Want to welcome those watching online, those who will be tuning in, uh, taking part in this uh, via podcast or our YouTube channel. All counts, all part of the church fam, no matter how you do church. But first and foremost, Merry Christmas. We did it. We turned the corner. We are now into Christmas week 2020. All right? Very highly anticipated Christmas. You glad we made it? Can you feel it? The countdown is on. Are you kidding me? Christmas week 2020. Let's go. Man, it's been a trip. Uh, We are continuing, actually wrapping up our Christmas series. See what I did there? Uh, We've been talking about Christmas, imagine that, week one, we talked about hope, Uh, the the hope that that child, the birth of Jesus, brought into our world. Uh, Week two, we talked about love. Last week, we we talked about joy, and today, uh, we're talking about peace. We're talking about peace. In the traditional Christmas story, non-Santa, not anti, but non, okay? Uh, In Luke chapter one, Luke chapter two, in uh, part of the story, the angels appear before shepherds and they deliver the world-changing news that a savior has been born. A savior that's bringing hope, love, peace, and joy. The fact, by the way, that God chose out of all people, out of all people, for shepherds to be the recipients of that message initially is one of my favorite parts of the story. But in that, in the message delivered by the angels, the angels say this to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think about peace. I don't know if you think about Bob Marley, Tom Petty, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, maybe Mickey Mouse. Uh, To me, he's more frolicky and happy, but maybe it comes from a deep internal peace within. I I don't know, all right? Uh, But peace can refer to a a lot of things. Uh, And it's funny because like, when it comes to the Christmas story, I don't really view the Christmas story as a story filled with peaceful events at all. I know if you read any story with a Morgan Freeman kind of voice, all right, in a poetic manner with inspirational music, all right, it can start to seem like it's, it's fictional or all right, an allegory of, of some form. I, I do believe that the Christmas story is one of historical fact, and for that reason, it is nuts. It's crazy. I mean, think about uh, most scholars uh, agree that Mary was likely around the age of 13, when she was told that she would uh, be pregnant. (laughs) As she was engaged to a man, which that engagement process was very different than our time today, and she was told that it was gonna be done in a very unconventional kind of way. The public scorn, the, the social isolation that had to come from that for Mary. Poor Joseph, that guy got sent a personal angel just to help him cope. And then think about like the journey, Mary, nine months pregnant, the journey that they went on, right? Because it's like tax season, isn't that exciting? You know, the whole census thing. And then they're told that, hey, um, you're going, Mary, really, (laughs) Joseph, help all that you can, but Mary's going to deliver the savior of the world. And they go following God's plan and no one has any vacancy. Thanks God, right? Right? I mean, I mean, and then the shepherds are on like the ultimate scavenger hunt you've ever seen, an historical one. I mean, it's insane. It, the story does not represent to me a, a series of peaceful events. And yet the angels say peace to those on whom his favor rests. And this child is bringing peace. So it must be a different kind of peace. It must be a different kind of peace. Uh, Jesus... Jesus, his whole life is filled with, well, unpeaceful events, right? (laughs) Chaos from his birth all the way through. In fact, fast forward to the night of his betrayal, right? Jesus lived a life where circumstances were flipped upside down on him, right? Not ideal. Uh, Jesus, the night of his betrayal, 
a night filled with chaos, a night filled with pain. He talks about peace. (laughs) But let's look at Jesus' definition of peace. Do you think I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but division. Yeah, that's what I said. I heard someone say, I. Yeah. Yeah, who invited this guy to the party? Yeah, and who, did anyone tell him that I was going to preach a message on peace? I remember as a younger, younger preacher and leader, uh, it was my first time giving a message on peace, and I was excited to study because, I mean, if anyone's pro-peace, it's Jesus, for crying out loud, right? And this is the first, ver- the first verse I stumble upon. Did I, do you think I came to bring peace to earth? No, I tell you, but division. What? I thought my whole message was ruined. Here's what Jesus is talking about. In Scripture, it's important to look at the verses before it, the verses uh, after it, right? The content of Scripture as a whole. He's talking about circumstantial peace. And Jesus is saying, hey, disciples, if you think, if you think that by following me, all of your circumstances are going to get better, everyone gets a raise, everybody gets a trophy, right? Everybody's uh, life circumstantially gets better. That's not the case. Instead, Jesus brings a peace beyond circumstances. And so Jesus is saying, if you follow me, there will be people who turn against you. If you follow me, life actually might get harder, more meaningful, but more difficult. I don't bring circumstantial peace I bring peace that goes beyond circumstances. Okay, so circumstantial peace is, uh, if we start thinking, well, once I get the promotion, I'll have peace. Once I find someone to date or marry, I'll have peace. Uh, Once my spouse starts acting in a way that I feel is reasonable, I'll have peace. All right, that is circumstantial peace. But Jesus brings a peace that goes beyond circumstances. As I was referring to earlier uh, in the conversation with the disciples at the Last Supper, talk about a night that can't be centered on circumstantial peace because circumstances are getting bad. He tells the disciples, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. See the difference? My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Can't miss it now. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Here's my goal for today. My goal is that we'll learn together what peace is, what peace does, and how we can experience it. All right? What peace is, what peace does, and how we can experience it. We all want peace. I don't know anyone in here who would say, Chad, I don't want peace. You want peace in your marriage, right? You, you want peace in your relationships or friendships. You want peace with your children. You want peace in the workplace. You want peace just within the walls of your own mind. We all want peace. But what is it? What does it do? And how can we experience it? Well, based upon this definition, Jesus clarifying that his peace is different than anyone else's peace, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let's translate that. Peace for Jesus is to be calm and confident in the promises of God. To be calm and confident in the promises of God. This is not dependent upon circumstances, right? This can exist on um, mountaintop experiences. It can exist down in the valley. But that is the definition of, of peace. For Jesus, it's to be calm and confident in the promises of God. Now, what does peace do? Peace gives us stability. Peace gives us stability. There's a passage um, in Ephesians where Paul talks about the armor of God. And in listing the armor, he talks about put on the shoes of peace. What he's referring to in ancient Roman culture was a Roman guard. His shoes were actually shoes that had spikes on the bottom, like a modern day cleat, you know, that athletes would wear. The Roman guard had these shoes with spikes at the bottom for stability, right? So no matter the opposition, no matter the conditions, the guard could stand firm. The shoes gave him stability. That's what peace does for us. It gives us stability. So no matter the opposition, no matter the conditions or circumstances in our lives, We have balance. We have stability. How many of you know, because I do, what it feels like when you lack stability? (laughs) 
When, when all it takes is a little push of opposition to get you slipping and sliding. The kids, right? Your mind's about to pop. Your marriage, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're exhausted. Uh, work is just so overwhelming. And all it takes is one little text or email for you to read into just a little bit to cause you to blow up. We know what it's like to lack stability, peace. Peace is to be calm and confident in the promises of God and it gives us stability. No matter the conditions, no matter the circumstances, we can operate from a place of peace. All right, obvious question. How do we experience it? How can you and I experience peace? So a few weeks ago, I gave a message. Uh, it was wrapping up the series, Bless This Mess, and I gave a message that was focused on the topic of joy. If you heard that message, you learned a new word, Eucharisteo, right? Grace, uh, Thanksgiving, joy. And, and in that, uh, you, you probably could tell that it was a message that deeply resonated with me. You know, the best messages from preachers are, are the ones where a preacher preaches to himself or herself and then shares with others, right? It's heartfelt. It's real. Well, that message a few weeks ago, it wasn't God just bringing me to a new point of knowledge. But after that message, these last few weeks, God has done a deep probing in my heart. Painful at times, very meaningful at all times. And God's had me kind of flesh out practice what it means to be a person who's a person of peace and joy. And so today I want to share with you some practical steps of how you can experience peace. These are ones that I have wrestled with, not just researched, but wrestled with because I too pray that I would be a person of peace and a person of joy. And so I want to help you today. I want to share that with you. At worst, it's a boring message for you. And it's not the first, it won't be the last, okay? At best, it's probably the best present I can give you, is to help you experience peace. So first, how do we experience peace? By sharing our thoughts and feelings with God. You can't skip this step. I often do. Backfires. But we, we start in experiencing peace by sharing our thoughts and our feelings with God. The other day, I remember my, it was just daily life. My, my head hurt. I could feel my, my blood pressure. You know, you're like trying to stay focused, stay disciplined, uh, uh, practice the principles that, you know, you, you have to kind of stay balanced, you know, and keep one foot in front of the other. And I was doing everything I could to maintain or receive experience peace while in the chaos of everyday life. And it took me a while to, to get to this part. This is often one of the later things I do. This needs to be the first thing I do to share my thoughts and feelings with God. Popular passage in Philippians says this, don't worry about anything, hilarious, right? Instead, pray about everything. Okay, so we flip those around, right? Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This is what I thought that meant. I used to think it meant if I pray, if I give God my worries and my thoughts, he's going to give me this peace that's like, whoa, where'd that come from? Um, you might get those. Yeah, anyway, I, I don't know if the feeling comes from that. Like, I, I don't, that's ideal. I don't know how real that is. I think this is instead what Paul is saying, that if you share your thoughts and feelings with God, the peace that he gives, gives you is better than anything that you'll experience from your own wit, grit, or determination. If you bring your thoughts and feelings to God, the peace that you will experience will exceed anything else from self-help or just your own little disciplines. Hey, those have their place, right? Those, those have their place, but nothing can surpass bringing your thoughts and feelings to God. Because when you and I do, he gives us that peace that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know why we feel stress and strain? 
I feel stress and strain because when something happens in my daily life that involves uncontrollables, my first response is to figure out how I'm going to respond and control the uncontrollables. And, and I start operating in a position that I'm not qualified for. I cannot navigate or run the universe. He can. So when I share my thoughts and feelings with God, I give him, I, I invite him to occupy a position that only he really is qualified to fill. But I will continue to feel stress and strain if I try to do a job in taking and managing all my anxieties and all the worries and all the things that have backfired in my day. I'm going to continue to feel the stress of doing a job I'm not qualified for until I say, here, God, and my worries don't go away. I just give them away. But we got to start by sharing our thoughts and feelings with God. How do we experience peace? By sharing our thoughts and feelings with God. The first thing, not a later thing, not the last thing, the first thing. Second, we experience peace by renewing our minds. Emphasis here on new, because that's what it feels like. It's not quick. It's not overnight. It's not like follow these three things and everything's awesome, you know? Instead, it's something that demands training, retraining of our mind, to renew our mind. Look what Paul says here. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. Do not conform to the patterns. You know the pattern of this world when it comes to pieces? Everyone looking for it, few people finding it, right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now that sounds peaceful. That, that sounds like peace. In the process of the last few weeks, from research and then just being, I guess, a live, exper a live uh, experiment <laughs> as God's performed surgery on my heart, I've learned some areas of my life that are areas of renewal when it comes to experiencing peace. Uh, areas of my life, categories, filters, in which God's been renewing my mind, transforming my heart so that I can become slowly a person of peace and joy. Hey, this is live in the heat of battle, by the way. This is like you walk in the house and it looks like you've never cleaned it in your lifetime and you just did yesterday. It's, it's live when <laughs> the other night we were looking at Christmas lights. We put all the family in the, in the van. We're going to go look at Christmas lights. It's going to be a time of peace, right? Yeah, right? My wife was dying in laughter. Isn't this peaceful? Kids are asking for the same song that they were asking for an hour and a half, hour and a half ago, and it's, it's been playing the entire time. Isn't this peaceful? Hey, experiencing peace, renewing your mind happens right in the workplace. When that coworker responds to you in a way that feels sharp, that feels personal, and you got to step back for a second and renew your mind quickly before you retaliate. Here are some categories of renewal when it comes to renewing our mind. First of all, gratitude. Gratitude. Again, you... Uh, a message uh, a month ago, you can look it up on our, on our website uh, for an exhaustive message on um, gratitude. But here's the question we ask when it comes to gratitude. What is the good in this situation? What am I grateful for in my day today? What is the good in this situation? What am I grateful for in my day today? From all research and study, the people who experience a life of joy all had some form of discipline of gratitude. Like there was no mystery to it. All the people who really, truly uh, were people of, characterized by joy all had some form of discipline of gratitude. It wasn't about how they had their discipline, right? How they went about their practice of gratitude, but it said they all had one. That would lead them to being people of peace and joy. I know the pushback on that. I know it's like, yeah, great. I don't really have time to sit down with a notepad or on my phone and write down all the things that I'm grateful for. I get that, okay, I get that. The other night, I, I, I have this, so I have this new practice of gratitude. More often than not, the last few weeks, I stop in a day, even if the kids are all running around being crazy, and I start listing things that I'm grateful for that day. It's amazing how quickly you forget, by the way, good things that happen in your day, because there's, there's problems to solve, right? 
Well, I forgot the other night. I didn't, I didn't get to it. <clears throat> I was feeling anxious. I was feeling worried. I was feeling grumpy and cranky. I was getting ready for bed, and I was already thinking about how I'm not going to get enough sleep if I even fall asleep. And, you know, like that whole mindset. And so then I had a conversation with myself. And uh, it was kind of like this, Chad, uh, you forgot your practice of gratitude today. And I said to myself, well, yes, I did, but I don't have time for that. And then I made myself, am I the only one who talks to myself like this? All right, I had to carry on the conversation. Okay, finish that thought out, Chad. Come on, go ahead, make yourself say it. Make yourself say it. I don't have time. I only have time to worry and to be grumpy and to be cranky and to be stressed and to think about how I'm not gonna get enough sleep tonight. That's all the time I have. That's what I have time for. It took a couple minutes. I started writing out some things I was grateful for that day. Remembering, not ignoring the bad, but holding on to the good as well. It transforms your heart. It renews your mind. It changes you in a way where, where you feel it. You, you feel it. So gratitude, what's the good? What am I grateful for? Here's a second uh, category, expectations. Oh, this has been heavy for me. And when removing it off of my heart, I, I have felt freed up to be a person of peace and joy in my day-to-day -day life again, but it's a constant discipline. Here's the question. What expectation are my negative feelings derived from? So you're at a spot where you feel like your peace is um, being stolen. Your joy <laughs> has been killed, right? A lot of times, those feelings come from unmet expectations, all right? Uh, many times, our negative feelings that steal our peace and kill our joy stem from unmet expectations. And more often than not, these expectations are self-made and unrealistic. Maybe you have unmet expectations in your life. Maybe you thought you'd have a more prominent job by now. Maybe you thought you'd be married or you, you would achieve a goal that you've been working hard to pursue. But when you think about it, this expectation was self-made. And maybe you've even turned it into a divine calling over time. But it's one of the main factors of stress and anxiety in your life. It has stolen your peace and killed your joy. <sighs> My life is filled with self-made expectations. And y'all don't have time to sit here and have me share them all. My life is filled with them. And when we identify them, we can hand those expectations over to God and say, I want to get back to trusting you with my life. And we can find peace and joy in our daily life again. But we have to let go of our self-made expectations when we let go of what life should be and accept what life is, it's a major paradigm change. We also have to ask ourselves, what do we expect from people? If I'm in an argument with my wife and I ask myself in the heat of the battle, what's my expectation? And my answer is, well, I just expect her never to be grumpy. I mean, that's perfectly fine. No, I think I'm setting myself up for failure. That's an expectation no one can match. I know if she has that expectation for me, I'm doomed. But we have to ask ourselves, what does this negative feeling, right? These feelings that are stealing my peace and killing my joy, what expectation, what unmet expectation are they tied to? Here's a third one specializing. This is, this is a little silly because I could use the word pride here, but we use that word so much, rightfully so, you know, it's toxic. But how about a little, how about a, a unique word? Okay. Specializing. Here's the question. Am I specializing or elevating myself? Am I, spe <laughs> am I specializing or elevating myself? The more I elevate or specialize myself, the more anxiety I experience. Here's the truth. I am one of 7 billion human beings. There is nothing I've gone through that nobody else has gone through. And I am not alone in my experience or status, but what makes me special is being loved as a child of God. I know before anyone yells like, Chad, you are special. Like, uh, yes. My value and my worth come from being deeply loved by God. 
But a lot of times, I, I elevate myself. I specialize myself. And by doing that, in distancing myself from others, I bring a ton of anxiety on myself because I start chasing these unmet expectations that I have for my special self. Even in my, in my preparation for today, I had to remind myself, Chad, you are a human being like everybody else. Because you know what happens when I start thinking, oh, okay, this is like the how many time I got there to preach. What if I do a bad job? What if they like, you know what? We thought he was pretty good. Nah, he stinks, honestly. What if my self-worth is beginning to be rooted in performance? You know what kind of anxiety that brings? But when my self-worth isn't rooted in performance, but it's rooted that I am deeply loved by God, and I am one human to many, and if someone's helped by this message, goal accomplished, that's a whole different place of operating. And I can have peace and joy in the process and not be crushed because I'm elevating or specializing myself. There is a uh, medical scientist uh, Columbia University, uh, a bunch of them gathered in New York. And one of the medical scientists presented that those who disproportionately use the first person pronouns of I, me, and mine have a significantly greater risk of having a heart attack. Yeah, he didn't even explain why, but he didn't have to. I mean, I believe him. It makes sense, right? The more that you focus inwardly, the more that you elevate yourself comparatively, right? Right? the more anxiety you bring. It's really a question of self-worth and value and who or what we're finding it in. Finally, sufficiency. Here's the question. Is what God has given me enough for me? This is piercing. Is what God has given me enough for me? If your answer is yes, you and I can operate from a place of peace and joy in our daily lives. If our answer is no, it's great to be honest, but you'll never really experience peace and joy. To move from a place where you're not viewing life through the lens of scarcity, but sufficiency is another paradigm shift. We spend our days thinking of, we don't have enough of this. You wake up, I, I didn't get enough sleep. You go through your day, I didn't have enough to eat. I didn't exercise like I was supposed to. I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I, I, I don't have enough money. I don't have, right, scarcity. But when you turn it to a place of sufficiency, and it's not ignoring the bad. Listen, our brains are really good at holding on to bad things. Really good. They don't need any more training. Our brains are really good at holding on to the bad things. Our brains need to be retrained to also hold on to the good. If you ignore the bad and you do like the whole la-la-la thing, you know, and you just focus on the good, you know what you're doing? You're actually numbing emotions. So you need to recognize the bad, but renew your mind to also recognize the good. I've been trying to work this out, being a live experiment here, with my eldest son, Trey, who's six years old, like this last week, sp specifically, we're trying this last couple weeks. So Trey comes in the other day. And he says, Daddy, I broke the screen door. I'm like, well, uh, let's go look. I know, you know what Daddy's downfall typically is here, right? I, I recognize the bad, <laughs> and I get consumed and, and maybe even snap. We, we went, and, and again, we've been working on this together. We go and we look at the screen door. I'm like, well, Trey, the bad news is and he kind of finishes my sentence, it's broke. I'm like, the good news is, trying to work this out. Trey kind of looks at me like, come up with something. The good news is, we might be able to fix it. Oh, yeah, good, yeah, yeah. We see the bad, and we're not going to deny it, but we also see the good. We see life from a place of sufficiency. When we do, we can experience peace and Joy. So how do we experience peace? By bringing, sharing our thoughts and feelings to God, by renewing our mind. And here's some categories and filters that you can run through. Finally, by choosing love and compassion. Choosing love and compassion. Paul talks about in Philippians, 
He talks about, oh, uh, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praise th- uh, worthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. A couple of things I want to point out. First of all, he says, think about such things and put into practice. Think and do. You know what happens when we share our thoughts and feelings with God and we renew our mind? Knowing there's no perfection, just progress, right? You know what happens? It frees us up to be able to think and do good things. To think and do. Peace is not just a me thing. Peace is a we thing. Joy is not just a me thing. Joy is a we thing. In fact, all the fruits of the Holy Spirit, if you go down the list, none of them are just me internal things. They are we experiences. If you want to experience peace, you can't just look inwardly at yourself and say, I want to experience peace. I want to experience joy. You will become a shriveled up human being. You experience peace when you choose love and compassion. And look what Paul says. Look how specific he is about how you carry that out. He's very specific. Whatever, 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 whatever. Isn't that awesome? How do you choose love and compassion? Whatever. In fact, for another example, listen to our friend Natalie. Hey, Bridgepoint. My name is Natalie, and I'm currently serving on the First Impressions team at the Tyrone campus as a volunteer coordinator. And I just wanted to share a little bit from my heart. Um, Over these past several weeks, I've been able to um, participate in many of the serve opportunities that we've had. And um, some of my favorites always include the Cold Night Shelter, because it's not only a really great opportunity to um, get to know the people that you're serving with, but it really gives you the chance to get to see and hear the people in your community and um, let them be heard and know that they're important. And it, it starts this trickle effect where um, the last one in particular, I was able to load my car up with all of the extra food that we had and hit the streets and um, go and share it out in the community. And it was a really incredible, incredible thing. And um, not only that, but as I was out and about, I was able to see familiar faces from the cold night shelter, from people that I had handed coffee to that morning. Um, And it's just, it's springboarding this fire in my heart, which is the coolest part because God's really starting to do some work. And, um, you know, since then I've been able to go in and deliver meals again to um, people who are, you know, out of homes right now or living in motels and, you know, just in economic hardships right now. So, um, and it all started from, you know, hopping in on a cold night shelter once upon a time and, um, without Bridgepoint, that wouldn't have happened. So I'm super grateful. And I just love that we can be Christmas during this season. And my hope is that it continues on, um, past the holidays and, um, that we can just spread it like wildfire and really get into the community and, and be the church and, and just love our neighbors so we can glorify God through that. So again, I just want to thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and I'll see you soon. Well put, Natalie. Well put. Listen, we can be peace by sharing our thoughts and feelings with God, renewing our mind and choosing love and compassion. I love what Natalie said. She said, in serving, by the way, that's not just a a Bridgepoint commercial there, if you will, right? The, the Christmas initiatives that we have are awesome, are exciting. Our family's looking forward uh, to participating as well. But this can look ha- whatever, right? Whatever. Uh, uh, your neighbor texts you today and said, can you help me move some furniture? Whatever, right? Opportunity to show love and compassion to your spouse. Always opportunities. Don't ask them to help you uh, see opportunities, right? You'll become overwhelmed very quickly, all right? But there, uh, there's tons of opportunities. What I loved about what Natalie said, she talked about that fire in her heart, the fire in her heart. When we choose love and compassion, we are taking part in something that's, that's wired deeply within us, that the creator put in us to love each other. 
And when we do that, we feel this peace and this joy that nothing else can emulate. So if we just keep looking internally and inwardly, we'll never experience that peace and joy that we're longing for. So how can we be peace and experience peace? By sharing our thoughts and feelings with God, renewing our mind, and choosing love and compassion. When I was reading through the Christmas story this last week, here's what stood out to me. When it came to Mary and all the chaos and, and all of the all the unpeaceful events and turbulence. Look how Mary's described. But Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and often thought about them. That's how I want to be described. As a person of gratitude, as a person who easily recognizes the bad, that's a piece of cake, but holds on to the good, who treasures these things in my heart and often thinks about them. That is a person of peace. That is a person of joy. The greatest promise and present we celebrate at Christmas is the gift of God's presence. The greatest promise and present that we celebrate at Christmas is the gift of God's presence. The things we've been talking about in this series of of hope and love and peace and joy are not just like uh, ideas or concepts to be pursued. But instead, they're found in a person. Jesus is God with us. And the more that we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, the more we'll experience the fruit of being with him. It's a process. It's a process of of being hope, of being love, of being joy, of being peace. But over 2,000 years ago, Mary and Joseph, with all the turbulence, with all the chaos, with all the unpeaceful events, they were able to be calm and confident in the promises of God because God was literally with them. Over 2,000 years later, we also can be calm and confident in the promises of God because God is with us. That baby... Jesus, who slept in heavenly peace, is the reason that we can experience the same. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of peace. Thank you, Jesus, that we can experience living peace Lord, thank you for the work that you've been doing in my heart. Lord, I pray as as someone who's kind of been that live experiment recently, I pray that others would also experience being renewed in their mind so that we together can become people of peace, people of joy, and that we can live it out even in the sheer chaos of life. Thank you, Lord that the Christmas story isn't one where everything just worked right. It's one of chaos. And yet a miracle right in the midst of it. Lord, I pray that that would be our story. That you would be doing a miracle in our heart right in the midst of the chaos of our lives. Thank you, Jesus, that you're with us. We want to celebrate you well this week in remembering that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.